Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we are continuing our series today on the attributes of the Lord uh, and what he says about himself, these kind of key characteristics of who he is and what he's like. Um, and uh, today we're going to talk about God being all-powerful. Throughout the scriptures, you get a beautiful picture of God being all-powerful from the very beginning to the very end. If you think about the opening verses of scripture, you have God with his own voice. Doesn't even use a hand, doesn't even lift a finger, uh, doesn't need to need break a sweat to create the universe around us. Okay, Everything that we know and see and experience came out of the mind and mouth of God, uh, that his word is that powerful. You fast forward all the way through to the very end at the book of Revelation, and God has create, recreated all things. Okay? Heaven and earth uh, has done away with sin, uh, has done away with the devil, has done away with the tears and sorrow uh, and sadness that we know. And he's done away with it all by the power of his living word, Jesus. And recreated all things and given us a living hope. God is powerful throughout all of scripture. Um, but another thing that you see in scripture and that I will, um, you know, uh, encourage you to look for, not only in scripture, but also in your own life and the world around you, is the way that men and women seek after power in various ways and always find themselves coming up wanting or broken uh, or lost. So that's what I want to begin by meditating on today is the ways that we as individuals uh, seek power and the uh, manners in which we, each one of us, seek power or security or strength um, and what we kind of put our hope and trust in for power uh, in life. And then what I want us to do is take it all, take, uh, I'm going to have four of them. It's actually going to be a little bit different than on your outline. Um, I'm going to have four of them, and I want us to take them and crumple them up like a piece of paper and toss them in the trash and repent of them as worthless uh, manners of gaining power. Okay? Um, here's the first one. You all know it. Uh, Power is not in physical strength, though many of us uh, think so. I think maybe men in particular uh, can, can put, their, uh, put their kind of hope and identity and power um, in this one, physical strength. Now, maybe you're not the Arnold Schwarzenegger of the, of the world. Maybe you're not actually physically strong, maybe you don't spend a bunch of time uh, in the gym pumping iron, but I wonder how many of you men, like me, um, will put much of your identity in what you are capable of, okay? The things that you can do. I can lift that. I can fix that. I can solve that issue or that problem because I'm capable. I'm strong. And I will put my identity, I'm going to put all my eggs in the basket of me being capable. You can usually tell if, you, uh, if this is the case uh, when it starts to kind of go away. Or if you get injured or something like that. And then all of a sudden, or if you stop working or stop doing your job, then all of a sudden much of your identity and meaning kind of go away because... Uh, the, the power and strength and confidence that comes from your own physical strength has left. And so you start to think, like, my physical strength is gone, so I, I must not be worth much, must not be, be capable of much. And so my identity is kind of gone astray. But the truth is that power is not founded in physical strength because physical strength, above all, is fleeting. Okay? Did you hear Isaiah 40? Even youth grow tired and weary. Even young men stumble and fall. Okay? Power is not in physical strength. Though boy, do we often look for it. Boy, do we often look at individuals who display the kind of prowess and physical strength and say, that person's worth following. 
I mean, look at the billboards. Look at the ads. Look at the TV shows. Um, uh, we we kind of worship or give kind of praise to the physically strong in our world, the athletes, uh, the individuals who who can show capability and uh, and physical strength. There's nothing wrong with it, but ultimately, true power, true identity, true security, is fleeting. If you put it in the hope of that. So you crumple it up and throw it in the basket and say, I'm not finding my power or identity or security in that. We do this too, right? Power uh, is not in beauty, but oh, how we worship. Uh, oh, how we marvel after. Oh, how we desire to be the ones who are beautiful and put hope uh, and identity and security and meaning in our physical attributes. How we look in the mirror, the symmetry of our faces, how nice our, our body looks, how aesthetically pleasing we are. Okay? Men and women alike. Okay? We can spend a whole lot of time looking in the mirror. And then all of a sudden, like the wrinkles start to come, right? And you start to think like, ooh, what do I do about that? My body, my face is changing. My husband's body and face is changing. What do I do, right? Because we put way too much stock in beauty, way too much stock in attractiveness, right? And the people that we look up to, the people that we give authority to, the people that we give power or attribute meaning to are oftentimes in our culture and our day and age the people who are the most beautiful or the most attractive. But how fleeting is that? How fleeting is beauty? How shallow is beauty to put your hope and your power and your trust in just because somebody is attractive, right? We will often be so shallow as people as to look at an individual and kind of stay away from them if they're unattractive. Okay? We do it oftentimes even in dating relationships. We'll look at people and kind of judge them first and foremost by what? Their looks, right? Apart from character, apart from hope, apart, what they, apart from what they believe or hope in uh, or trust in, we look and say, oh, are they attractive? First and foremost, right? It's fleeting. It's foolish, there's no power in it. There's no meaning in it. There's no security in it. There's no identity in it. It just goes away. We all be beautiful maybe for a little bit, but then it flies out the window and you have to wave goodbye to it because power does not come through beauty, right? Here's another one that we, you'll notice that none of these start with P or apart from the first one. Apologize for that, but uh, I thought of better ones <laughs> uh, later this week. <laughs> Um, power has not come through wealth. But boy, oh boy, how we can seek after that as the thing that's going to give us, that's going to put up the strong walls. Man, if I have enough money, then life's going to be okay. If I have enough money, then life's going to be good. Okay? Life's going to be fine. I'll be able to do the things I want. I'll be able to be the things I want. I'll be able to have the uh, security and the strength, and I'll be able to carry myself well in the presence of others because I know that if I can, uh, I can always fall back on my pocketbook. I can always fall back on my bank account. Right? How often we worship the rich in our society, look up and say, I want to be like that guy who lives in the big house with the nice car, who always seems to have the nicest clothes, or the nicest suits, or the nicest, uh, nicest things that you can wear. We do it on every single level, right? As soon as you start getting to school, you start noticing, ooh, he's a rich kid. He lives in a nice house, Okay? Ooh, she's a rich girl. She was very nice clothes. I wish I was like her. Because we constantly attribute power to wealth. How foolish, right? Read through the book of Ecclesiastes sometimes and, sometime and see how the richest man and the wealthiest man in all of history at that time, what he thinks about the power that comes through wealth. He says it's fleeting. He says it's a joke. And he says the biggest travesty of it all is that one day all of the wealth that you have sought to accrue is going to go to somebody else. You don't get to take it with you. 
You get buried with nothing. You came into this world with nothing. You go out of this world with nothing. And the laughing stock of the world is that those who put their hope and, uh, in, the, in the power of wealth will be left behind. Because ultimately, it's going to go to somebody else. Somebody at the end of your life is going to say, hey, thanks for all the hard work you did. I'm going to get to take it to somebody else. Okay? So don't put your power or your hope of power in wealth. Crumple it up. Throw it in the wastebasket. It is a foolish endeavor. Now you'll notice these things are okay. Physical strength, fine, okay. Beauty, good for you. Wealth, all right, great. Use it for God's glory, that's okay, whatever. Uh, but do not put your hope or your identity or your meaning for power or strength in it, okay? It's not going to get you through. It's going to let you down. Finally, this one, charisma. You know this person? The person who always does well in a crowd, always has the right things to say, always has the right words for the right situation, always is the kind of center of attention for the room, right? They may not be the, uh, the physically strongest person, they may not be the most beautiful person, they may not be the wealthiest person, but boy, do they have charisma. Boy, can they carry a crowd. Boy, can they, can they lead, the, lead other people well, right? And we'll look to these people and say, oh man, they're charming, I, 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 know, I know they got a lot of flaws. I know they're not the greatest people, but boy, oh boy, is he so charming. Is he so nice? Is he so, oh, he's, he's just so, so good in a crowd. Okay, he's so funny, right? We will often do that. Often wish we were those people. Often put our identity or hope in those things. But it's a foolish endeavor. It's a foolish way to go, to put our power or our hope for power in any of these things because ultimately they will let you down, okay? Uh, they will make a fool out of you. Now, God, though, is, uh, is very powerful. If you, uh, if you look throughout the scriptures, we kind of talked about it at the beginning, um, that God is very powerful. But I think there's this great, great verse in, in Isaiah that describes the power that God has, okay? This is from Isaiah. Who's measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Notice that that's a singular hand, one of these, okay? All the water in the, in the entire world. Who's just measured it out in his hand and said, there we go, that'll be an ocean, okay? Uh, who has uh, marked off the breadth of the heavens? Uh, who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains and the scales and the hills in a balance, okay? That's not hyperbole. It's, it's not the writer just trying to make you think of God fancily, okay? It's saying God is deeply, deeply powerful. He's strong. He's wise. He is all-powerful in all circumstances, okay? God is power. He is the place where we get our power. He is the hope that we put in for power and strength to get through every circumstance. But I'm also struck by, uh, by looking at power in the life of Jesus, okay? Uh, because Jesus came as not only a propitiation for our sins, a stand-in for our own weakness, but he also came as our example of what it looks like as individuals to live in the power of the Lord, okay? To live in faith for the power of God to get through our circumstances in life. Uh, consider what Isaiah says about Jesus, prophesies about who he will be. And think about it in regards to those four points that I said, okay, about beauty and physical wealth and, uh, and strength and, um, and charisma. Hear, hear what Scripture says about Jesus and those characteristics that, that you seek after for power. Who has believed what he has heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, Jesus, grew up like a young plant. Does that sound strong to you? Uh, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form of majesty uh, that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. Does that sound like somebody who's beautiful? Does it sound like somebody who's charismatic? Uh-uh. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and well acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. The, in, in all of the, uh, of the Gospels, 
Jesus in his physical form is never described. It never says like, oh, he was a carpenter, so he was real buff, okay? Never says that. Never describes that, okay? He, he was described as poor. He was described uh, as, as an individual who came from a poor family, never had a home, never had a bank account to speak of, depended on other people and depended on the Lord, okay? He, he was not beautiful. His, his, his physical attributes never described. Okay? In the book of Isaiah, he said, nobody would, have thought, nobody would have thought of him as beautiful. Right? Nobody would have cast an eye upon him. Okay? Even though he was charismatic, even though he had people that followed him, people who, who trusted him, people who, uh, who, uh, who desired to hear his message, ultimately the Lord was simple in his teaching. So the Lord, I think, becomes very, Jesus becomes very instructive for us in how to live by the power of God for our daily circumstances. Because we all know that we need power to get through the circumstances that we face in life. Each of you and every one of you, at some point, if you don't right now, will feel weak, will feel beyond yourself, will feel like the situations and circumstances that you are called to are too much for you. Here's what you do, okay? Here's the response that you have. First, we admit our own lack of power, okay? You throw the other things in the trash. And you shout out with the Apostle Paul, when I am weak, then I am strong. When God brings me to my knees, that is his perfect place to work in my life. His power is perfected in my weakness, Paul says, right? So oftentimes, when we feel weak in life, we feel like things are out of control and that there's no way that we could ever get through it. That's not what the scriptures say. The scriptures say, when you feel weak as a Christian, those are the exact moments where God is working in your life where the, the exact moments where God is carrying you through, where he is coming to your aid where he is willing and able to be called upon and responded to, okay? So, if we want to know God's power, first we have to admit our lack of power, okay? That we don't have it all together, that we do not have the capability. If we're relying on our own strength to get through, you better get ready to fall on your face. But when you do, understand that God is saying, that's the place where I can work most readily, in your life, because it's a place where you will most likely depend with your whole life on me, okay? I, I, it's, it's a good thing for us to admit our own lack of power. Second, believe in God's power, okay? Uh, th this, is, this is kind of accounted for all throughout Scripture, too, that when people are at their wit's end, when they have to, they're at the end of their rope, they find hope in these sorts of words, all things are possible, possible for the one who believes. Or from Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, right? When you are in the moments of weakness, okay, when you feel beyond yourself, placed or pushed beyond your limit, okay, we as people and as Christians hope beyond hope, okay? We believe when everybody else has gone away. And we hope in these sorts of words that all things are possible from God. From the beginning to the end, from birth to the grave, all things are possible for him who gives us strength. Okay? Those words from Isaiah 40 are not just for the young. They're for everyone throughout all of time. Death to life. We believe in God's power. Second, we confess our faith. I always find hope in this. That when we feel weak, that we just call upon the Lord. Okay? So 2 Corinthians says this. We have the same spirit of faith according to as, as it is written. I believed and therefore I have spoken. We also believe and therefore we speak. When you read through the Psalms, there will be constant times where uh, the psalmist will, will be beyond himself. Uh, like he can't do anything for himself. Can't, can't, uh, can't figure out a way outside of his own limitations or fa failings or hardship. But what he does is he calls on and confesses the name of the Lord. He says, I will hope in you. I will trust in you even though my life is failing. 
Even though in Psalm 51, uh, even though I have messed up beyond all belief, I'm going to call on you for a cleansed spirit, for a renewed life. It's a confession of faith that says, I believe that you are here and you are ready to answer me. And I'm going to speak it with my mouth. Have you ever done that in prayer? When you're kind of beyond yourself or when you don't know what to ask? Just begin by claiming the promises of the Lord. When you're beyond your own limitations, you fold your hands and you say, Lord, you are powerful. You hold the world in your hands. You hold the oceans in the palm of your hands. And I know that your word says that you are with me. I claim that and I confess that and I depend on that. Help me through this circumstance. That's a way of confessing your faith. As the word of the Lord speaks, you speak in the situations that are beyond yourself. And you claim God's power in the situations uh, that, that are too big for you. Okay? And then finally, we decide to act in faith. 2 Peter 1.3 says this, His divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life uh, through our knowledge of Him who has called us by His own glory and goodness. Okay? So part of living by the power of God is that when we feel at our wit's end, we do this. We admit that we are. We believe in his power. We confess it, and then guess what? You stand up, and you keep going. Strengthen your weak knees, as Hebrews said, and keep walking in faith. That's the way we do it as Christians. That's the way we respond. Now, sometimes that might look different than others, okay? Okay. Uh, sometimes it might mean a conversation. Sometimes it might mean that you, uh, that you continue to act uh, as, as you've been called to. But I'm always struck by uh, our, our gospel reading today. Okay? Did you hear the story? It's the story of, uh, of Jesus uh, calming the storm. Okay? He's, uh, he's in the boat, and everybody always focuses on his words of power. Okay? His words of power, as he stands up and says, be still, quiet, and all the seas go. But what I always notice is that nobody ever focuses on Jesus' trust in God's power. Okay? Where do you see that? When all of the world is shaken and quaking, and the seas are rocking like crazy, and everybody else is questioning God, uh, not calling upon him, is saying, oh, Jesus, do, do you care if we drown? Come on, wake up. What's Jesus doing? Jesus somehow, amazingly, has enough trust in the power of, of God, his Father, that he takes a nap in the back of the boat. That he says, he looks at the circumstances around it and says, I, you know, I trust that he is going to get me through this, and I trust in it so much that here's a pillow, I think I'll take a nap. I think there's just a word of gospel for us there, right? That, that in, in the situations that seem so beyond us, that you might be able to rest in those when you are fretting to take control by your own physical strength or charisma or money or power, to take control of your own situations and figure them out by yourself. Maybe the Lord is saying, hey, why don't you take a nap? I have this. You can trust in me that I can hold this whole situation secure. So find peace to get through every circumstance in the fact that you are dependent on the one who holds the seas in his hand. Okay? He calls us to decide and act in faith. He calls us to confess our faith. He calls us to believe in him. He calls us to admit. But he might also call you to just stop and trust as well. Because ultimately, he is the one who cares for us, and he is the one who holds more power than we could ever have, and is the only one who cares for our life more than anybody else could, and gets us through every circumstance that we can't. Would you join me together now, then, in a word of, uh, of prayer? Heavenly Father, you, um, you are the strong one. We are the weak ones. We admit that, but we confess that you are a God who is for us, with us, guiding us, giving us your strength for each day and trial of life. 
May we hope in that, trust in that, rest in that, and live in that. It's in your name we pray. Amen.